guys, my name is Dr. Jennifer Lococo and I am a naturopathic doctor and owner of Lococo Wellness Clinic. And today I have the absolute honor of interviewing Dr. Rujane Killian, who is an ER medical doctor. And today we are going to be discussing the differences between conventional medicine and naturopathic medicine. And we're going to discuss how we can utilize both of these medicines so that you can get the best of both worlds for your healthcare. So stay tuned for an absolutely amazing interview. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Dr. Jennifer Lococo and I'm a naturopathy doctor and owner of Lococo Wellness Clinic. And I have the pleasure of interviewing Rojane, um, who is an emergency um, medical doctor. Um, so, so as Jane said, my name is Rojane Killian. Um, I've been in Canada for about two years now. I'm originally from South Africa. Um, GP trained, specialized in emergency medicine, as she said. And currently I work in Grey Bruce Hospital up in Owen Sound in Ontario. Um, and we're loving it so far. We do miss the sunshine. I'm not going to lie. And this winter has been long. Um, it's a great pleasure being here with you guys. And it's a great honor to, to do this interview with you, Jane. Okay, amazing. All right. So we're just going to dive right into it. So the first question I have for you is what made you want to become a medical doctor? Okay, so I think uh, probably most doctors get, ans get um, asked this question. I'm not sure if naturopaths are the same. And for a long time, um, I didn't have the typical answer. When I came in, usually in school, about since 10th grade, 11th grade, you start thinking what you're going to study because you want to start preparing. Um, in South Africa, you go into university straight away. You don't do pre-med, pre-law, pre-something. So you decide at, at school. And around 11th grade, that's all I wanted to do. There was no other option for me, to be honest. And um, went into medical school and a couple of years after that, um, I was sitting around speaking with my parents and they said, well, it wasn't strange to them. It was something that was, that they kind of probably always knew. Apparently when I was a young kid, there was, I'm not sure if you remember Rescue 911 that showed on TV. I'm not sure if you oh. ever saw that or if I may be, I'm maybe telling my age here. Um, but it was a show that showed in South Africa and we used, we usually went to bed around seven, eight o'clock and we could hear the the um, music from Rescue 911. Apparently, every single night this show showed on TV, I would cry because I wanted to show. I wanted to watch the show, um, and it's all about paramedics and rushing them into the ER and stuff, so and like that. Um, and then the second part that she told me was uh, my sister had um, extreme or severe febrile seizures and epilepsy when she was younger. And I think it's one of those mental things that I I really blocked out. And when I started going through some some neuro linguistic programming and stuff, there was definitely one thing. Um, that came out of my mind was me sitting on a step at a hospital and my, my parents were inside with her. And at that stage with febrile seizures and stuff, um, they put them in these big oxygen tanks. So it's very sci-fi looking, very intimidating. And that's definitely one of my childhood memories that, um, that stands out like I can see it right away now. Um, so I think it's always been there. And then a couple of years back, we, we started researching my mom's family. And apparently all through her family lineage, there was doctors all over. So I think it was, it was probably set up to be, um, and I cannot think of doing anything. I've got a lot of, a lot of other hobbies, but that was, I was definitely born to be a healer. That's for sure. Okay. And why an ER doctor? Um, I'm a, I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. So I think that's the easy answer. Um, and I definitely do not like routine. So I did, I did do family practice for a couple of years just with ER shifts. Um, and I was, a, I was a good GP. I do care enough about people to be a good GP, but the monotony of it just got to me after a year or two, just doing the same thing over and over and over. And then the, the deeper answer to that was that there were so many ethical things that I, that I started clashing with as a family physician. Um, where I wouldn't, the things that I'm prescribing to people, I wouldn't use it myself or the things I'm telling parents to do to their kids, I wouldn't do to my own kids. And for me, so that was an easy transition to ER medicine. It's all, I think it's mostly acute medicine. It's trauma medicine. You're, um, you're saving somebody's life. You're not putting them on a lifelong prescription and stuff like that. So I think that was an easy transition. The other thing, um, we're, we're still, I'm very competitive. I love my job. We're still very conservative in a sense. So I know, I knew I wanted to be a mom. I still wanted to be a wife. Um, and some of the other, I'd love surgery as well, but that's something you're always a surgeon. You're full-time surgeon. So you don't have family if you do that. Same with family practice. Sometimes your practice is your family and you never get to see your family. So I think that was an easy, easy decision as well. You do your shifts, you work hard, 
But when you're home, you're home. You don't have any calls, follow-ups and stuff like that. So I definitely still enjoy it. Okay. So scheduling, flexibility, and the fact exactly. that you're an adrenaline junkie. So that rush exactly. of emergency we need to treat now and making that exactly. difference in the emergency room for people. Definitely, okay. definitely. All right. And what are your thoughts, since I am a naturopathic doctor, um, what are your thoughts on alternative medicine and naturopathic medicine? Um, the thing is, Jennifer, I think there's a very large misconception from my side of the world when it comes to alternative medicine. Um, and I think it starts from day one when you go to university. Um, there's no, our, our way of schooling, I don't think it's only just in South Africa, I think it's all over the world, it might be worse in North America actually, where your schooling is so narrow-minded, um, it's just this way, there's no other options. And in all honesty, I don't think alternative medicine should be called alternative medicine. Um, that was the medicine for thousands of years. My type of job should be maybe called alternative medicine because that's been around for a hundred something years. Um, so I don't think there's anything alternative about it. And to me, the word is almost a meaning in a sense. Um, it should be all, type of, all types of medicine. My job should just be a small section of medicine. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. I love that. So basically it's, we should just be looking at all types of medicine necessary and they all have their job and they all have their use. And so we never really should be using that word alternative really for any type of medicine. Okay, cool. Um, exactly. Okay. And what advice would you have for the general public on when to utilize, for now we're just going to call it naturopathic medicine, um, when to utilize yes. naturopathic medicine and when to utilize conventional medicine. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think most of the time, if there's any acute situation, um, acute trauma, any accidents, injuries, things like that, that's the obvious thing where you would go to a hospital or ER, ER facility or your GP if they can manage some stuff. But where I'm getting the sense that the way that I was trained, I'm not there to treat anything chronically. Um, and that's when you start need to start thinking holistic. Um, and a big thing for me is is to... I hammer on when I speak to some of my clients and patients and stuff, it's about your intuition. When you're going to see somebody, you don't, do not hand over this, your little common sense hat as soon as you walk through that door. And unfortunately, I think that happens too much. It might happen in the naturopathic world as well as the allopathic world as well. Go see somebody, you're asking them for an opinion. You're asking for a consultation. You are not handing over your power to that person that dictates what your diagnosis is, what your plan is, what your prognosis is. If you do not resonate with that person and their plan, then go, go find other options. And there are so many other options as well. Um, naturopathic, obviously homeopathy, but there's energy medicine. There's so many other things that you can bring into your own plan. And I always tell um, people as well, especially when you're working with pediatrics, they can't tell you anything at that moment, but their parent is their intuition. So that's the person that you listen to. A mom knows best. Listen to a mom about the intuition that she knows about her, her baby or a dad even. They've got the same intuition. Um, so it comes down to, I think, listen to your own body. Most people, if they start listening, would have the common sense to know, listen, this would be um, perfect for a holistic type of view. Or I cut off my arm, I need assistance right away. Or I need assistance right away for the next week or so. But most of the times, I think we're getting to the point we're not thinking holistically of health and we're just treating symptoms. And unfortunately, that's a big part of my world is just treating symptoms. Yeah. Okay, I love, Regine, I love that you brought up intuition. I think that's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I know even for my own practice, I had a cancer patient once and she um, it was big severe stage four breast cancer and it was left untreated. Mm -hmm. She wasn't even receiving treatment within the conventional realm. And I was very fearful as being the sole person that she was relying on because she was like, yep. I'm making the decision that this is something I want to pursue and you're the only person that I want to receive guidance for or receive treatment from. And I was very fearful because I was like, exactly. I don't want to be responsible for all of this. No. And the patient actually had to sit me down and say, listen, it is my opportunity or is my um, right to go and consult with conventional doctor and it's my right to go and consult with a naturopathic doctor and at the end of the day 
I am the only one responsible for what my outcome is based on what my decisions are. So she was telling me, trying to make me feel more comfortable, <laughs> trying to say that this is her choice. This is what she's yeah. choosing. And I'm not ultimately responsible for what the yeah. outcome is. This is, she has freedom of choice. So where would you say that you see a lack of intuition, intuition in um, practice? Like, could you have an actual story that you could share with us where you see a lack um, of intuition? I can't think of a specific story at the moment, but I think it comes in. There's, um, there's a lot of things that our medical world has, has kind of made standard protocol. Um, it's, it's one of those, do not break these rules. This is what you do. This is what you inject. Um, and I see a lot of people with this, this little voice in the back of their mind, especially when it comes to mom saying, listener, I'm not sure I'm doing the the right thing for my child at that moment. And that's probably the thing that's bothered me the most in the last couple of years is that that little voice that gets squashed by basically bullying and intimidation from the medical world saying, listen, you know, we were taught the right way. This is what you do. This is how you, um, this is how you prevent certain things. Um, do not go read online. Do not go Google. Do not go think for yourself. Um, we know exactly what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And then when there's side effects stepping in, um, that mom or dad is so fearful, they forget that, that ha they had that little voice telling them from the beginning that something is going to go wrong. Um, so I think it's more of a general story, um, but it's almost a sad story as well, because a lot of these things, um, a lot of chronic illnesses starts from something that triggered it. And um, I want to mention, I, I'm not sure if you and some of your listeners have watched the documentary on Netflix, Heal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen that Actually, yeah. and it is amazing it is amazing it's it probably condenses I think I've watched like the first half of it I haven't time to finish the whole thing but it condenses almost all of the philosophy that I've that I've collected in the last 10 years into the first 40 minutes where it's um we have lost I think we've we've somebody have told in the last couple of years we've got the sense that we've got so much freedom but it's almost like a matrix it's a false freedom where You've got all this information, but it's almost too much. It's the voices, the noise, and everything's too much. You're never getting to the point where you're just focusing and getting to the point of where you are in control of your mind, of your emotions, of your heart, of your faith. I'm a believer. So that's where I find, that's where we find our peace and our grounding and our foundation, whatever it is for you to find that. And that's when that voice is going to come from. A voice or intuition doesn't just fall from the sky as well. But if you're not going to surround yourself with a peaceful environment at first, it's impossible to hear that because it's just too much. It's just too much noise. Great. And you also mentioned a lot oh. about the fear, the fear that gets instilled in patients. And I feel like even, and I have to be honest with you, I think that even on the naturopathic side of things, like I feel that that fear in mm -hmm. whatever condition we discover that the patient may or may not have, um, that definitely is a factor. Um, what would you say, what should patients do when they fe feel that they are making a decision based out of a fear that is being instilled in them from their practitioner? Um, I think it's going to be a difficult answer to say what do they need to do, but I think the biggest thing is, is actually to realize that you're making a decision out of fear. And I think this spreads um, farther than just our health. Um, I'm from South Africa, obviously, and there's a reason we're in, in Canada at the moment, and it's because of the political situation in South Africa. The way we are, we are raised, we are raised totally out of fear. Everything's around being safe, surrounding yourself with um, guarded doors and gates and things like that. So when my husband and I started moving here, you definitely go through almost like a detox period, but you're go we went through a big depression where it's this um, cooking pot situation, and now you're out of that. Now you need to basically get to know yourself again where you're reacting differently and not just out of fear because most of the time fear is a um, counteraction to a an idea of survival um you think you only have one way to act because you're you're surviving at that moment you're not living so i think the biggest issue is actually realizing that fear whatever you're going to do with that idea of that you're making decisions out of fear is going to be different i think in different paths of life and different people it depends on what their background is and um, what um, what exposure they've got to different options, um, their opportunities to get different treatments and things like that. But um, getting to the point of making that connection between what's going on here and the rest of our body is the first step. 
I think after that, it depends on how you're going to manage it. There's so many neuro-linguistic programming. Obviously, the essential oils that I work with um, has played a huge part in just opening up channels. And um, that was definitely a big part for me, the emotional part of the oils. So there's different options of getting to getting past that fear, but recognizing is the first step, definitely. So people to recognize their intuition, start listening to themselves, start listening to their body and noticing what feels right for them, I guess, is what exactly. you, your advice would be. Okay. Exactly. Amazing. Okay. And what changes do you think need to occur within our current healthcare model? Ooh, do you have all day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, I, even while we're talking, Regine, I'm just sitting here being like, oh my gosh, having another talk about having a fearless um, medicine system and all these other different avenues that we can branch off from this conversation right now, I would love I think, to I think exactly, we can chat for another year, yes, obviously. Yes. Um, I think, Jennifer, how do we change our, our health model? I think for us to realize that we need to change it is that we have to, that we have to recognize it was never... It was never right from the start. It was broken from the start. So it, is, it was kind of set up for failure. It was never in a good place and then it suddenly broke. Um, and I think it's mostly from my side, but a little bit from the natural person side as well. Um, and there's one, my, one of my favorite persons, people to quote is Paracelsus. Um, and I think he would be, probably be definitely one of my partners in my practice if I could have him today. But he was definitely an outsider. I think it was in 1493 when he, when he was busy practicing. And for him, it was at that stage, making the connect between um, the physical realm and the spiritual realm already. That's the first part. And then the biggest thing is that we, our whole medical system is not about um, health care. It's about sick care. The whole focus is on dis-ease. It's not about the balance of finding health and wellness. Um, and I always tell people when they're asking me the difference between GPs and naturopaths, um, I say there's great GPs out there and there's great naturopaths. You get both in both worlds. But you do have to realize as well, that's why you need to trust your intuition as well. When you're going to see a naturopath, it could be an amazing naturopath, but it could just be a naturopath that has using the same model as the GP that you just moved from. They're just basically using plant medicine and homeopathy to treat the same thing but they're not treating holistically as well. And the problem is our whole medical system is just based on treating symptoms and they see the body as a little machine. And that comes out in the HEAL documentary as well. It's a little machine with gears and stuff. Um, there's nothing outside of that machine. So if you can tweak a gear here, then everything should start working together again. And it comes from the industrial age that we were seen as the products of the industrial age. And that is probably so far from the truth as it could be. That's why I say this goes back thousands of years where we've totally taken the whole healthcare model and turned it upside down. And that's why we're having so much trouble. Our, I think our civilization has never been sicker as a species as we are today. Um, the, the plus side to that is I don't think we've ever been in a point where people are asking more questions mm. than what they are today. So that's luckily we're getting to that point where people say, listen, here, at least they're recognizing something that we're doing is not working. So we really need to start asking the questions. Okay. Where are you noticing that people are asking questions more now? Um, in the ER? Like, would you say that's something you're seeing? I think, no. No. no they, don't, okay. they, don't, they don't ask the questions until, okay. you, until you throw out a lifeline. Okay. So obviously I get a lot of things because I bring in a little bit of Absolutely. a little bit of natural things. So I just touch touch base with them. Most people would be too afraid to bring up questions in, in a sense. Um, and in all honesty, a lot of my colleagues, um, there's a whole sense of, oh, that patient's coming in, the one that Googled her symptoms before she came in and stuff like that. And for years and years, um, it never bothered me. In all honesty, everybody Googles doesn't matter if you've got a qualification or not, you cannot know everything. Yeah. I would be more afraid of somebody that doesn't Google or doesn't go look for answers or think they've got all the answers. But for me, it was a good sign already that that patient is not just walking in there expecting something from me without taking any responsibility for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you go out and look for it, people are asking the questions, but they're still, it's once again, it comes down to the fear-based thing. They're still too afraid to voice their opinions sometimes. So if you're not plugged into some of the um, either Facebook groups or social groups or 
um, newsletter groups and stuff like that, I don't think you would be aware as much as you could be that there's really a shift coming. Yeah. So I loved what you said that the generation is sicker than sicker than we've ever seen in history, you would say, right? But at the yep. same time, people are starting to ask the question. So this could be the opportunity for this paradigm shift to occur at this time. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's the, that's the history of humankind. Um, we're pretty slow about learning. I mean, if you just look at history, it usually takes some tragedies to actually wake us up as a species to say, listen, what are we doing? And it's not working, unfortunately. And I do think we're at that stage. Okay, this is great. This is so exciting. Okay. Um, do you see a future where medical doctors and naturopathic doctors can work alongside one another to provide the best possible health care? For sure. Maybe it's the optimism in me, but um, I really do think, and there's, there, we cannot just exclude one or the other. There has to be um, a collaboration between the two. We both bring different things to the table, um, but for that to happen, both sides are definitely going to be going to have to be more open-minded. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years, I think I probably was, would have been more skeptic, um, but with my involvement with the essential oils and obviously the company and stuff that we're in, um, I definitely see the, the drive is there to start bringing the two worlds together. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if I can mention with doTERRA, the fact that they're opening up hospitals, prime meridian hospitals that they're opening up. Know, where the amazing. Exactly. They're opening up four hospitals. I think two of them are functioning maybe already in the States, um, one out of um, Utah and the other one I think is maybe in Texas. But their whole mission is to open up these hospitals where patients that walk in has the option of choosing both in their treatment plans. And that's the way to go. Um, and especially, especially if you've got complex stuff that we need to figure out, um, maybe one day we can all go back just to natural medicine and plant medicine and things like that. Um, that would probably be the aim and energy medicine and all of that. But we've got such a crisis to, um, to save at the moment that you're going to need the biggest team Absolutely. that you can. And we need yeah. everybody on board to do that. I agree. Oh, I didn't know that they were doing that. That's great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Very exciting. Oh, visit yeah. One now. yeah. Okay. What difference do you think it would make if MDs and so medical doctors and NDs work together? Like what would the difference be for the patient's experience? Um, I think it would, it would probably be, in all honesty, it would make it easier for them to not feel guilty about choosing one or the other side. Because there's this whole guilt thing about, um, especially from family members, and there's a very big stigma once you start asking different questions. Um, and then there's also a sense of somebody that doesn't go to a GP, um, what else are they doing or what are they neglecting and things like that. So there's, I think a lot of stigmas around patients would be, would definitely be broken. And apart from that, the influence on the patients, I can just imagine the advantages to both sides. Um, if we start actually collaborating and discussing things, what grows can come out of it? What new ideas of getting to the bottom of diseases and stuff um, that we can get to? And it's like anything in political fields as well. Once we stop all the squabbling about all the unnecessary stuff and the polarization, once we get past that, the only way to really grow as a species is to get input from the outside. That's all about, that's what, our, what debate is about. It's not just about bringing across your point. It's about being confident enough to stand your ground with the knowledge that you've got, but also that confidence spreads in the sense that you're open-minded enough to not just keep on challenging what you believe, but start taking in new ideas and both sides will improve and get better and reach a new enlightenment because of that. Okay, I love that. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about your business. So this is your mm -hmm. alternative business that you have been involved with for how long with doTERRA? Yep. Um, so last year, probably around June or so, um, we went through, I went to my first essential oil class, Jess Johnstone. She's a nutritionist um, here in Owen Sound. And um, my sister was still here. She's an occupational therapist. So we went to the class together. And I heard a little bit about essential oils, but definitely not enough. Um, when in South Africa, where our 
background with natural medicine, I think is a little bit easier because of our culture. We always had the older women that had their herbs in their garden. And, um, you know, when a baby, when a baby has um, a toothache, you give them clove oil. It's one of those things that you just grow up with. Um, it's definitely not something we're taught in medical school for sure, but was part of our culture. So it wasn't such a big jump. But in all honesty, when we went to that class um, and we said, listen, but everything makes sense. We can smell the quality. We know what it works. And especially with my, with my sister, she's got a um, two-year-old that had really, really bad speech delay and sensory problems and things like that from medical treatments. Um, we could see we could count her regression and stuff backwards. And then she started using um, one of their blends. And in all honesty, during her within two weeks, she started forming new words. Within a month, she started forming sentences and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, there's definitely something up in that. And I'm a researcher. My, um, if anybody knows our Gallup strengths, is something that you can go do online. You can, I highly recommend it. I'm all about input, learning, and intellect and strategy. That's all I am. So for probably three months after that, I kind of locked myself with my iPad and just went to go research oils. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it was like a rabbit hole. There's, it's an unending rabbit hole once you realize how big part of health um, I wouldn't even say disease because obviously you use it to treat disease, but health in general, essential oils are. Um, so from there, we decided, listen here, I find so much value. And I think I, within the first couple of nights when I spoke to Jace, I said, I'm getting to the point where I'm working to merge and I'm saving lives. I'm getting them to the ICU, but I'm not changing one patient's life. Um, I'm not changing their lifestyle that brought them into my emergency room. I'm not changing their mind about how can they get themselves healthy after that? So for me, not being in family practice at the moment, I see it as a very easy connection that I can have with our community. The other thing for my culture group that's really important is we want to make an impact in our community. So that's definitely something we miss coming from South Africa. So it's an easy way for me to start spreading my, my roots into the community, especially we've got two little kids um, and my husband's a criminal attorney, so um, he's going to start setting into the community as well. But if we want to make a positive influence, this was strategically probably the easiest way to connect with people. Um, and you're not telling them, listen here, go somewhere and get a wife machine assessment and things. You're telling them to smell a bottle of oil that smells amazing. You get the toxins out of their home. And if they've got medical issues, I can sit with them and say, listen, okay, let's go research together and see what we can use to start getting you onto a path of wellness as well. So it's been amazing. I went through my, to my first doTERRA convention within three months with a company. And that's probably, it's been one of those life changing events, um, not just from the company, the product sense, but the energy at that place where 35,000 people sitting in an arena with the same, the same mission of, taking care of their own health, taking care of the health of their families, changing their community with the positive vibes, new oils, um, and then starting to take responsibility for nature as well. Because that's definitely a big part of their drive is taking care of what we were given. If we find so much value in natural medicine, responsibility to make sure that that's sustainable should be such a big, big drive. Um, otherwise, we're, we're running on this naturopathic um, medicine bandwagon Within a few years, there's nothing left. So what are we going to be stuck with? Synthetics. That's all we're going to have left. So um, that's been, it's been an amazing journey with him. Um, the integrity, the people that I've met, the people that I've been surrounded myself with because of that, it, that's basically one of the reasons I met you guys um, a couple of, couple of months back was because of that connection. Um, so I definitely see it becoming a big part of my world. Um, and it's been, it's been lovely so far. So... Last June, you get invited to an oil class. And what was mm -hmm. the, what was the, was it your sister that said yes and asked you to join? Um, we went both together. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and we, we just couldn't, it was so overwhelmingly, it just made sense um, yeah. for us to change our, our homes and our toxins and stuff at our home. It was such an easy jump. It was such a practical jump to say, okay, well, we can get everything from this company. And especially when I went to go research the safety around it, it wasn't, it wasn't a difficult decision in all honesty. Um, I didn't think I was going to build with the business side of it and doing classes and things that came out of the research that I did where it was just the next step. I just couldn't stop from not making that jump basically. Yeah. So you go to this class in June, you already had an underlying understanding because of your culture coming from South mm -hmm. Africa, 
you are familiar with the power of botanical medicine, you've seen globe oil being utilized with children who are having toothache or having pain. Um, yes. So all of this made sense. And then you go to this class, you smell the oils, you're like, you know what, the quality bar none. You already know instantly mm -hmm. that this Definitely. is very, very uh, authentic with the oil. And because you're coming from a medical doctor background, you head home, you start researching like mad, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're you're looking to say, okay, this is not just something I want to integrate in my home, but you're actually actually like I want to be able to give other people the gift of this knowledge. And you said exactly. that not all medical doctors consider themselves to be healers, but Regina, you labeled yourself as not just a medical doctor, but as an actual healer, right? Exactly. And I think that this is another route for you to be able to heal people because you said you said that you feel like you don't change people's lives in the ER room, which I would debate with you that I do feel that you definitely do, but I think mm -hmm. that you just meant in terms of you're giving them that immediate fix as opposed to giving them something that they can walk away with, integrate into their lives and have a long exactly. standing difference. So this is something that you're really passionate about that you want to share. And you also said it gives you a sense of connection with the community. Exactly. And would you say no, that, definitely. Is that different? Is the community different here um, in Ontario and you're living in Owen Sound compared to where you were living in South Africa? Is that sense of community and that sense of connection different? Um, yes. Unfortunately, I think um, a lot of times with our new the new way of lifestyle, it's we're a global village, but I don't think we've ever been more alone than we've been in today's time as well. Um, we've got a lot of superficial connections, but in South Africa, once you're as a culture group, when you know you're you're under so much strain from safety and political um, political um, what do you call it? Unrest or unrest. There we go. Let's let's put it as political unrest. There's a sense of getting together for the safety side of it. So community is such an important part. It's almost something that you cannot function without. Um, unfortunately, you can't rely on the government. You can't rely on the police services. You have just your community. Um, we're here. I find it. Um, we're grateful to be here. It's it's an easy lifestyle in a certain sense. Everybody has their issues. Every house has their cross. But it's an all sense still. It's an easy lifestyle where there's a lot of things that you don't even have to think. It becomes automatic. Everything's taken care of you. The roads are taken care of. So I don't think there's such a high need for the sense of community if you do not go look for it. There's in every place you get, there is going to be a community. You just need to, it's your responsibility to find that and to say, listen, yes, I resonate with it. And if even if it's not 100% because of the cultural differences, my home language is Afrikaans. Our, our home language isn't even English. So just that, that disconnect be. I'm thinking in Afrikaans and speaking in English, obviously there's going to be that little bit of distance between you and then the cultural background. They don't, they don't know how you think. They know what you're speaking about. But um, it, it's once again bridging that gap in order to learn from, from both sides. Um, and it's easy if you immigrate, you can come and sit here and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna raise my kids, try to raise them as Afrikaans as possible, which most people actually do is they put them in English schools and they just become Canadian. Unfortunately for our sake, our culture and our language and our religion is so important for us. We don't, we don't want that to happen either. And it's not that we're looking down on Canadian culture. We see Canadian culture, the beauty of it is actually, um, the assimilation of all the cultures, but not just becoming one culture. It's actually the beauty of the versatility and the diversity that you're putting in. But in all honesty, it has been, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been, it's definitely not as easy as when you're trying to just move to a different town in your own country, obviously because of the cultural differences. Um, but we did live in BC for a couple of years and we do find Ontario much easier to connect with than some of the people in BC. Um, but Owen Sound, this area, I think, is a lovely place in the sense of there's still this small town feeling. Um, and it's close enough to the city, but there's still the sense of values, conservatism, um, trying to make a difference in your area, local markets and things like that. So that sense of taking responsibility for yourself and your environment, that was easy to connect with on a certain sense. Amazing. And, you know, bringing up community and the reason why I asked what the difference is in South Africa and coming here to Canada um, is because this is my question, which I think I know the answer to, but you'll, you'll mm -hmm. answer. Um, would you say that the lack there of, of a strength in the community, building strength in the community and knowing that you have that support, would you see a direct impact in the health of the population who don't have that strength in community? 
definitely, definitely. Um, that's where I think a lot of that knowledge comes from my sister's side. She's an occupational therapist, but she's all about psychology as well. And she said a lot of our mental health, um, apart from the connection between our minds and chronic disease and things, it's, it's because we are lonely. Um, we are supposed to be function in a pack mentality where you've got that close connection with people. Um, and a lot of people just don't realize it. You're not connecting by watching TV or chatting on Facebook. It's not the same as actually sitting down with a cup of tea and visiting with somebody, watching your kids play together. Um, and that physical, physical aspect to it of giving somebody a hug, handshake and things like that. Um, so as I mentioned, my husband's a, an attorney, but what he also does is martial arts coaching. And he's done that for many years. We had a big academy in South Africa and he just opened up his academy here in Own Sound. Um, but thank you. Thank you. And he always says he's a life coach. His language that he uses is martial arts and the impact that that has. And a lot of times, especially for men in today's age, I think there's such a focus on women, which is great, obviously, but there's such a toxicity around men where there's no good, examples anymore the men are just as lonely as women um where a place like that a martial arts academy where you're getting that physical input into each other's lives just the energy that's exchanged in that way has been life-changing in so many ways for people and once you just once you have an influence in one person in a family the father figure that positive energy just flows throughout the whole family so that's definitely where, where we start working together is we're very focused on the small family group um that's definitely a big part that's very important for us that's why we homeschool our kids they've never been to daycare and um, we've been blessed enough to be able to do that but um a community is only as strong as the families that are in that community and i think that's unfortunately a big part of what's what's broken if you want to say not just in canada and all over the world is that strong communities a strong family sense um has just been shaken about too much so for you this goes far deeper than just the whales like that when you say that this is to help you build a sense of community make a positive impact in your community i mean just from what your husband's doing and opening up his martial arts and um company or um center and then for you to be side branching with the oils this is like how you want to be responsible for your community i think that's so beautiful okay. you literally are my role model you and your husband i haven't even met your husband <laughs> but i just love hearing about this such thank a beautiful authentic genuine and just thank you, positive thank for this world so i just thank you guys for actually immigrating to canada being part of our community being part of our culture impacting us and providing us with expert knowledge in the medical field and i'm sure with your husband in law but expert knowledge in the medical field but then having that open mind and i know that you said that you are also studying um you mentioned paracelsus but this is like a branch of paracelsus mm -hmm. teaching and can you just share a little bit about exactly. what you're studying yes i'm a student again i don't think i'll ever stop being a student that's just my personality but um i'm doing my doctorate and phd in quantum integrative medicine um and i think just the name says it all um, if you watch again that documentary, Heal, they talk about the fact that for a long time, the, the physical world or the metaphysical um, world and the physical world, there was no way to connect that through science because we were based on Newtonian physics, which is like looking at a piece of paper at a two-dimensional piece, but you can't lift it up and see the whole three-dimensional. When quantum physics came in and people understood quantum physics, finally, there was a way to put the connect between science and what we know has been true for thousands of years and that's the physical realm the energy around everything um so i just happened on this university it's a university out of hawaii so the plus is you graduate in hawaii yes cool. you do so go to trip. hawaii to graduate I'm exactly like, okay. amazing <laughs> that was that was strategic i'll yeah. try to make the graduation in winter for sure um but i've been amazed by the the amount of knowledge and just their um the consultations or the people that teaches the curriculums and stuff, the people that they've connected in this university has exactly the same mindset of saying, listen here, we need to start again from the bottom. Um, there's no way to fix both. So let's take a little bit from both, but start from the first, make a curriculum where you're integrating all of these. So I'm just in the beginning of it. Um, they, I will definitely see how it goes. There's been a new development. I'm nine weeks pregnant, so I'm not sure how much studying is going to be done in the next couple of yeah. months. <laughs> 
Um, but that's definitely, that's definitely the plan is to finish that. Whatever, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that for now. At the moment, it's just, it's a way for me to legitimize the fact that I know all of these things. It's something that's been in my intuition, but I want the qualification to say, listen here, I'm not just talking from somewhere out of the clouds. There is proof, scientific proof, that these things work and you can put these things together. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and yes, we'll see. Maybe I'll open a clinic or be a consult. I don't know. We'll see what, what I do with it. Or I'll just study more. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure the future is going to have many different opportunities for you. And I can't <laughs> wait to hear about them and talk about them more with you. Virginia, it was you, an absolute Jane. pleasure and honor to be able to have this opportunity to interview you. I thank you so much for sharing your story, your history, sharing about your relationship and your children, about your career, about your doTERRA business, and about what you're currently studying. Thank you so much. And I hope that we are able to, I mean, the point of this video is really to educate people to know that there is no bad with medicine. That was really my intention. I don't think there's a, a good or a bad. I really do believe that if we can all just get on the same page and say our ultimate goal is just to help people heal. And we need to heal in exactly. all different formats. And I just think if we're all on the same team and we're all on the same um, page, then ultimately we're going to have that positive impact in our community and help make this world a happier, healthier place. So thank you. I for could not agree more. This And I hope that you'll be open to doing more because I really, really love talking to you. Um, so Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to just.